Moby Dick or the Whale by Herman Melville Chapter 36 The Quarter Deck It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe that one morning shortly after breakfast Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen after the same meal take a few turns in the garden. Soon, his steady ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented, like geological stones with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon the ribbed and dented brow, there also you would see still stranger footprints the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question, those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And, so full of his thought was Ahab, that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see the thought turn in him as he turned and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him indeed that it all but seemed the inward mold of the ever outer movement. Die mark him, Flask, whispered Stubb. The chick that's in him pecks the shell. Twill soon be out. The hours wore on. Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon the pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near to the close of day. Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Sir, said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads there, come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces, were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and as though not a soul were nigh him resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat, he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask, that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, What do ye do when ye see a whale, men? Sing out for him, was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of club voices. Good, cried Ahab, with a wild approval in his tones observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. And what do ye next, men? Lower away and after him. And what tune is it ye pull to men? A dead whale or a stove boat. More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approving grew the countenance of the old man at every shout while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marveling how it was that they themselves became so excitedly at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again, as Ahab now half revolving in his pivot hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them all. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give order about a white whale. Look ye, die see this Spanish ounce of gold, holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It is a sixteen-dollar piece, men, a doubloon. Die see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. 
While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words, was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the main mast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw? Whoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale with three holes punctured, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke? Look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins, they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. It's a white whale, I say, resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul. A white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men. Look sharp for white water. If ye see but a bubble, sing out. At this while, Tashtego, Degu, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest. And at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. Captain Ahab, said Tashtego, that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick. Moby Dick, shouted Ahab. Do ye know the white whale then, Tash? Does his fan tail a little curious, sir, before he goes down, said the gay header deliberately. And as has he a curious spout too, said Daigu. Very bushy, even for Massetti. And mighty quick, Captain Ahab. And he have one, two, three, oh, good man iron in his hide, too, Captain, cried Queequeg disjointedly. All twist he betwixt like him, him, faltering hard for a word and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle. Like him, him, corkscrew, cried Ahab. Aye, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wretched in him. Aye, Dagu. His spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat, and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool, after the great annual sheep shearing. Aye, Tashtego, and he fan tails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils, men. It is Moby Dick you have seen. Moby Dick, Moby Dick. Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask, had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg? Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing. Aye, Starbuck, aye, my hearty's all round. It was Moby Dick that dismasked me. Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stub I stand on now. Why, why? He shouted with a terrific loud animal sob, like that of a heart stricken moose. Ay, ay. It was that accursed white whale that raised me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Ay, ay, and I'll chase him round Good Hope and round the Horn and round the Norway Maelstrom and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what he have shipped before him, men, to chase that white whale on both sides of land and over all sides of earth till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think you do ye look brave. Aye, aye, shouted the harpooners and seamen, running closer to the excited old man. A sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. 
God bless ye, he seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye, men, Stuart, go draw the great measure of grog. But what's this long face about Mr. Starbuck? Wilt thou not chase the white whale? Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly comes in the way of the business we follow. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market, hoot! But come closer, Sarbuck. Thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting house, the globe, by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb. What's that for? Methinks it's rings most vast but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck. That simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall, shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak havoc that hate upon him. Talk not to me, a blasphemy man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For such the sun do that, then could I do the other. Since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master, man, is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eyes. More intolerable than fiends glaring in dust stare. So, so, thou reddest and palest. My heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat? That thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look, see yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reasons for the toward life they feel. The crew, man, the crew. Are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See Stubb. He laughs, see yonder, Chilean. He snorts to think of it. Stand up amid the general hurricane. Thy one toss sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but to help strike a fin. No wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? For this one poor hunt, then the best lands out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining sees thee, I see, the billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak, I, I, thy silence then, that voice is thee. Something shot from my dilated nostrils, he has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine, cannot oppose me now without rebellion. 
God keep me. Keep us all, murmured Starbuck lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquaintance of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the mast, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again, Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life. The subterranean laugh died away. The winds blew on. The sails filled out. The ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings. Why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye prediction than warnings, ye shadows. Yet not so much predictions from without are as verifications of the foregoing thing within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities in our being, these still drive us on. The measure, the measure, cried Ahab, receiving the brimming pewter and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then ranging them before him, neither the capstan with their harpooners in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group. He stood for an instant, searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met him, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves met the eyes of their leader, ere he rushed on at their head in the trail of the bison but alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. Drink and pass, he cried, handing the heavy charged flagon to the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round, short draughts, long swallow men. Tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes it in ye, forks out at the serpent snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me. Here's a hollow. Men ye seem the years so brimming life is gulped and gone. Stuart, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered ye all round this capstan. And ye mates flank me with your lances and your harpooners. Stand there with your irons, and ye stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that. Ha, boy, come back. Bad pennies come not sooner. Hand it to me. Why now this pewter had run brimming again, wert not thou... St. Vitus Imp. Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with the extended arm, he grasped the three level, radiating lances at their cross center, while so doing, suddenly and nervously twitching them. Meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to stub, from stub to flask, it seemed as though, by some nameless interior volition, he would feign have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the laden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stub and Flask looked sideways from him. The honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. In vain, cried Ahab, but maybe tis well. For did ye three but once take the full forked shock? Then mine own electric thing, that, had perhaps expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down, lances. And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cup-bearers to my three pagan kinsmen here. You three, most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners, disdain the task what, when the great pope washes the feet of beggars, using his tiara for ewer? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension, that shall bend ye to put it. I do not order ye, ye will will it. 
cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood with the detached iron part of their harpoons, some three feet long, held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Can't them. Can't them all. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so. Now ye cupbearers advance. The irons. Take them. Hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly, going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpooner sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now three to three ye stand, commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha, Starbuck, but the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners, drink and swear, ye men, that man the deathful whaleboat's brow. Death to Moby Dick. God, haunt us all. If we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death. The long barbed steel goblets were lifted to cries of maledictions against the white whale. The spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled and turned and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed, and Ahab retired within his cabin.